Hey there, this is Matt once again. Welcome back to another Star Trek review, and this time it is Star Trek 3, The Search for Spock. Really cool poster. And this is my third favorite Star Trek film behind Star Trek 4, The Voyage Home, and Star Trek 1, The Motion Picture. This is my third favorite. This is one that gets tossed aside. No one talks about, no one mentions, or is put down, or is kind of like, eh, it's a nothing movie, which I disagree. I love this because it's a personal story with the characters and the, one of the big reasons why I enjoy the first six movies in the original series are the characters and the actors. Kurt Spock, McCoy, Uhura, Sulu, Chekhov, Scotty and the characters get their moments to shine, work well together and this is, in a way it's a sweet story of them doing what they need to do, even though they're going to be court-martialed, even though their careers are going to be over, in order to save a friend, a.k.a. Spock. And I thought Leonard Nimoy did a really good job with the characters, with the... Uh, the characters gelling with each other, dialogue with each other, as well as having some excitement and danger. I mean, you get the death of Kurt's son at the end of the film. Uh, you have Christopher Lloyd as the villain. I thought he does a really good job as he wants this Genesis thing from the last movie. And like I mentioned, that review sort of becomes a, imagine the atomic bomb, and now people want the atomic bomb. It's, you know, the Soviets in the U.S. in the Cold War. It's really that, that battle for this weapon while for the crew they just want their friend back and Leonard Nimoy got the chance to direct along with part four Star Trek 2 when it came out it did surprisingly well for Paramount so they're like we gotta make a part three and they're like well we want Spock back so okay what can we do to get you back well this is a story we can do I like to direct the film. At first, they're like, oh, yeah, sure. And then they didn't call Leonard Nimoy back. He's like, what's the deal? He's like, oh, you don't like Spock. You want Spock to die in your contract. He's like, no, I didn't. Look at the contract. Yeah, the contract's for Star Trek too. Oh, okay, we believe you. And then they let him direct. And I guess for people, maybe they thought... This was sort of a middle chapter movie that you can only do so many things to you had to follow A to B to C to or, or did you get spot back. But I enjoyed the journey. I enjoyed the journey with these characters. I think it has a lot of fun stuff. And again, Christopher Lloyd, I think, is one of the better villains in the Star Trek films. He's very uh, he's having a lot of fun with the role. He's very expressive. Uh, again, one of, definitely one of my favorite Christopher Lloyd roles. And I'm not sure if Leonard Nimoy had directed before, but he did an impressive job with this in Part 4, which led to him doing even non-Star Trek movies like Three Men and a Baby, which I love Three Men and a Baby. Tom Selleck, Steve Gutenberg, Ted Danson, love that movie. Now, people forget Three Minutes of the Baby was like the most successful film at the box office in 1987. Don't believe me, look back. I think, I think it was number one. I think it was the most successful film of that year. And yet that film never got a special edition, no individual Leonard Nimoy, which I love to hear his thoughts on it, now it's too late. Which is why I get pissed off at these fucking studios, not doing anything, but being fucking lazy. Studio can release, I love Army of Darkness, I, I liked it, but you don't need to release 15 fucking versions of Army of Darkness, but you don't release one good version of Three Men and a Baby, or Run Away with Tom Selleck, or you release like one DVD, old DVD with nothing on it, you don't even release them on fucking Blu-ray in the US, I got Run Away from overseas, I had to do that. Three Men and a Baby, most successful. Sorry, I'm going off tangent. But Leonard Nimoy 
He showed he was a really capable director. Industrial Light and Magic returned for the effects, which they did for Star Trek II. They did another wonderful job with the look of the ships, the Enterprise, even one ship called the USS uh, Excelsior. The destruction of the Enterprise, which was not a common thing. I mean, the Enterprise in itself became a character in these movies, and when you got to the ending, well, the beginning of the third ad and the Enterprise was destroyed, it really felt like, like they gave it the respect, like Leonard Nimoy that gave it the respect of a character dying. Because they knew that the Enterprise itself was a character. And you know, they had that great line where Kurt's like, oh my god, what have I done? And McCoy goes, what you always do, turn death into a fighting chance to live. You know, that's a great line. When you destroy the Enterprise, almost every fucking movie, like Star Trek movies nowadays, it loses its... Like, you pretty much destroy it into darkness, might as well. Then you really destroy it in Star Trek Beyond, and then you... This generations destroy their Enterprise in generations, and then it's like... How many times... When you do it so many times, it loses any effectiveness. I know generations is different from this, but I'm just saying that... Like, Come on, you gotta use a bit more imagination, man. But this was done very well, and when you get to that sequence. But even though it's like the beginning when they show the end of Star Trek II, and they show in this little box, and it pushes into the camera until it's full screen. And Kirk is still reflecting on the death of Spock. Like, I left the noblest part of myself back on that born planet. The Genesis planet. I think Christopher, Lo Christopher Lloyd did a great job as the Klingon and his cloaked bird of prey. And I'm trying to think if this is the first time we saw a cloaked bird of prey. The cloaking thing. I'm trying to remember if that was on the series. I haven't seen the series in forever. You start to read aficionados, you can tell me... When was the first time you had the cloaked bird of prey? The fact that they could cloak. They might have had it on the show, but I can't remember. But I always thought that was a cool idea. Like, they can't fire until they uncloak, but they didn't fly invisible. And I, I, I always forget little stuff in this. And it's nice watching it. I always forget that Christopher Lloyd's Klingon has this weird-looking, crazy dog type of thing. And again, one of the things nice about this is the the cat, the crew. They get their chances to shine with nice dialogue. Scotty uh, talking shit about Excelsior. They say, "Oh, the Enterprise is much better." Oh, but 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 but. And Scotty goes, "Yeah, if my grandma had wheels, she'd be a wagon." <laughs> they give McCoy to force Kelly something to do because of that remember thing. The second film, he's going a bit crazy. Uh, the Federation won't let them go back on the Enterprise. It won't be refit because, like, well, the Enterprise is 20 years old. So they're going to trash it or something. Spot's father comes in and he's like, Kurt, how come you know you left his body there? What about his Katra, his living spirit? And he does this sort of nice little moment with the mind meld where you have this close up of. Kurt's eye, and then you have Sarah's mouth, and at times sounds like Leonard Nimoy. I don't know, just the way that was done with the camera angles brought uh, some nice emotion to that moment as Kurt, like, remembers. And he explains, yeah, we were separate, he, he couldn't touch me. And then Kurt sort of realizing what's going on with McCoy and oh well we need to do this we need to help my friend McCoy and we gotta get Spock's body but the plan has been quarantined and it's against regulations but he's like you know he's got fucked it I'm going to get them and bring them back to Vulcan because they're my friends. Kirstie Alley did not come back as Savage I don't know why 
I don't know if she just didn't like it or salary or what, but Robin Curtis, which honestly, I always like Robin Curtis more than Kirstie Alley in the role. I just, I like Robin Curtis. I forget what else she's done, but I always thought she just played the character more, I was not, yeah, less awkward. Like, Kirstie Alley did fine in Star Trek 2, but I don't know, just Robin Curtis, I don't know, I, I just felt had a little bit more, I liked her delivery of the lines more. I don't know, I just thought she had a presence that felt a little bit more natural to Star Trek. I don't know how else to, to word it. But between the two, I, I always pre I prefer Robin Curtis. And like I said, each character gets the moment, like McCoy in the bar, and he's watches people like playing like playing this one video game with hologram like biplanes and another person with a tribble. And you get the idea that McCoy's talking a bit like Spock is trying to get a ship. He's like, how do you be deaf with ears like that? And he's talking to another guy. Where's the logic in that? If I wanted to ride home, would I be here in a bar wanting a space flight? And like he's trying to do the Vulcan nerf pitch on the security guys not working. It's like... <laughs> Um, and there's a lot of natural, you know, funny stuff in the movie. That's the thing is that they have a handle on the characters and they let the characters shine. And that's one of my favorite things about this. And I thought this is one of the uh, movies that the pace went very well and never got bored with this movie. James Horner comes back to do the score. The score fits well, like his score for Star Trek II worked well for the movie. And a lot of little fun moments, like when Kurt realizes what's going on, he goes to check out on McCoy, and he does the Vulcan salute. It's like, how many fingers am I holding up? And McCoy's like, that's not damn funny. That's not pretty damn funny. And Kurt explains what happened to him, and McCoy's like, that green-blooded son of a bitch. This is revenge for all those arguments he lost. <laughs> uh, it really made me laugh. They get McCoy out. Sulu does a flip on a guy who called him Tiny. And it's like, don't call me Tiny. Um, a horror gets her. A horror. Michelle Nichols get her. Gets her moment where this guy's kind of not realizing, it, but he's kind of talking to back to her, saying, well, "Come on, you're you're out of your prime, but me, I need some, uh, you know, an excitement and adventure." And the Kirk McCoy then come in. And the guy's like, "That's Admiral Kirk." And he says this line, I forget what the line is, but something to do with reality. Like, have you lost your sense of reality? And she goes, this isn't reality. This is fantasy. And holds a gun on him to, he'll, she'll stun the shit out of him, makes him go into a closet. So it's, again, nice that people get their moments to shine. And she's going to go in the rendezvous, and it's the five of them, Kurt, McCoy, Scotty, Chekhov, and Zulu steal the Enterprise. Uh, I always thought that was a fun idea. And them stealing the Enterprise as it's coming out of the Doctor of the Federation. One of my favorite pieces of the music from James Horner. Uh, Miguel Ferrer, may he rest in peace, who's been in Robocop and Deep Star Six, and uh, he's been in many other films. He's there as a little bit, as part of the Excelsior crew. And they're about ready to go chase the Enterprise, and their ship fucks up because Scotty fucked it up. Uh, meanwhile, Robin Curtis and Merritt Boutrick, who plays Kurt's son, who comes back from Part 2, they're on the Genesis planet, and they find this boy, and we kind of figure out it is Spock, who's growing, he's growing more and more as the planet is unstable, and in like a few hours or you know, more than a few hours but it's gonna blow up it's unstable the Klingons get there they capture the three of them yeah this battle between the Enterprise and the Klingons And that's where Kirk gets the idea. Okay, fine, you guys come along, and he has to self-destruct the ship. 
and they beam out while the cr the Klingon crew beams in. Nice work with the effects with the blowing up of the ship. And people don't remember this was 1984. 1984. It worked very well. Uh, the effects. And you know, they blow up the ship and take a lot of the Klingon crew with them. And that's where you get that nice moment where the when the crew is on the plan to look at the Enterprise, and I like the look that it looks like a falling star, like a shooting star as it goes down. I thought that was a nice, uh, I like the way that looked. I thought it was a cool effect. You know, turn death into a fighting chance to live. Uh, you know, Kurt shoots one clean on. Um, by this point, Sally, uh, his son's been killed. Uh, which I, of course, I, I can't forget this moment where when he finds out that his son's dead and he backs up and then he falls out of the chair. Now, that was a nice moment. It shows that Kurt is, uh, of course, out of it. It's a good, nice uh, emotional moment for William Shatner. Which, you know, I don't know the man in person. I've heard all sorts of stories. But as an actor, I've always enjoyed William Shatner as an actor. I like his delivery of lines. I like his gusto. And I always liked his acting. And I think he does a good job in the emotional moments, too. Like when he finds out that his son's been mur murdered. I think he does a great job. I've never had a problem with William Shatner's acting. Either I find it very fun or entertaining or very likable, or at times like that moment, you know, good on an emotional level. I like that Kurt and Christopher Lloyd get on a fight, and Kurt's trying to protect Spock, and the planet is crumbling, and they're both fighting each other, punching each other. Kurt gets on a ledge, ah, jumps on him. It does the kick. I have had enough of you. Kicks him three times to Christopher Lloyd's death. Gets him and Spot beamed out. <laughs> and yeah, they get back to Vulcan. This one fun line when they get the Vulcan and this, uh, I forget the character's name, but she's she's sort of the high priestess, I guess, of Vulcan. And she's like, okay, well, we'll you put the capture out of you into Spock's body, but it's very dangerous. And McCoy's like, I choose danger. And then he goes, hell of a time to ask. <laughs> and so nice, again underrated film with uh, people don't really mention the dialogue in the movie like when Spot's father thanks him and Kurt goes you know, because Spot's father is talking about you know all the stuff you've lost your son your career uh, you know at what cost and Kurt goes if I have if I had not tried the cost would have been my soul but that was a good line and Spot is alive, but he's sort of amnesia. He's like, doesn't, not sure. He's like, I've been told you're my friend. And he starts remembering some stuff. Uh, I like the, the line, Jim. Your name is Jim. And the smile with William Shatner. And it's a good feel good movie uh, at the end. Despite the cross, at the end, you, you smile. Again, I love what they do with the characters. The characters work well together. They get a lot of moments to shine. Well, maybe some don't get a lot of moments, but the, the way they gel together, you really get a sense of the friendship of the crew and what they want to do to rescue one of their own, mixed in with a fun performance by Christopher Lloyd. Uh, Kirk did in a hands-on fight, which that's one of the things about Star Trek too. Him and Khan never even got to face each other, but at least here, Kurt and the bad guy got to face each other and actually have a fist fight. You know, not, you know, a physical fight. It was a nice change of pace. Star Trek 2, you get the starship, you know, 
fighting one-on-one -on -one with starships. Here you get the back and forth. And I like that. They were not copying Wrath of Khan. They were being its own movie. I appreciate that. And once again, it has a lot of memorable sequences. The destruction of the Enterprise, and, you know, Jim, your name is Jim. A lot of the fun moments with the characters with McCoy and Sulu, you know, don't call me tiny. And <laughs> a film that isn't talked about a lot in the Star Trek movies, but to me a damn good flick if you like the characters, like I do. And it was just a, a fun journey to see these t characters get together and do whatever they can to save their friend and to get their friend back. Camaraderie, if I just pronounce the word correctly. I think that's one of the things that I like the most about this. You know, a lot of fun dialogue. And a little bit underrated performance by Christopher Lloyd because with villains they don't really talk about Christopher Lloyd's role in this. And again, after the bummer ending of two, the, the ending of this is much more of a positive ending. But that's my thoughts on Stretcher 3, The Search for Spock to me, a great sequel. Leonard Nimoy, I think, did a wonderful job directing the film. The cast do their jobs very well. Either way, thanks for watching. Take care. And this time I'll talk about my favorite Star Trek film, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. See you guys later.